So welcome everybody to episode 11 of the White Shark Interest Group podcast. We are Facebook's largest White Shark specific group. Now, I am happy to say well over 48,000 members. So thank you to all the members of the White Shark Interest Group. If you're not a member and you're listening to this podcast, head over to Facebook and search the White Shark Interest Group and you will find us. It'll ask you a question why you want to join this group. Give us a little shout out and say it's because I heard the podcast. We'll get you in the group there and you can join the other 48,000 members for discussion and debate the photos the videos at this time of the year there's a lot of talk about shark week which brings people in if you've come through to this through shark week then please do feel free to browse all the past posts in there our motto is to educate conserve and protect great white sharks and we do that through healthy debate and discussion and if you're a regular on these podcasts now you'll know this is about the time that i introduce who is on the podcast we've got a treat today because we've got practically all the admins bar one joining us we have our family Founder Dirk. Hi, everybody. Back again, we have Javier. Como estamos? Buenos dias, everybody. We have Melissa back on the podcast. Hey. And we have, for the first time on this podcast, we have Anna. Hey, guys. And we have the much requested Drew. Just imagine I said something witty. <laughs> <laughs> That's a keeper. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have Sarah today. Uh, Sarah is off diving again, as she does, which is why we are just waiting to get Sarah on uh, on a future episode about diving with sharks, and that will be coming up soon. Uh, but today, we again wanted to do something a little different. Thank you to everybody for your feedback on these shows. We try to keep the topics varied. We have guest episodes. We have discussion episodes. Today is something that I wanted to talk about for a while, and that is Jaws. Because we talk about Jaws a lot on the podcast. It always crops up and it crops up on the group. And it's always one of those topics that somebody says, that's how I got into sharks. Especially people of, say, my age. I mean, I'm like 45. Jaws came out when I was young. And, and, I, saw, and I grew up on that. And that essentially is what made a lot of people shark advocates. Love to prove that, wouldn't you? Get your name into the National Geographic. But there's a bit of a contradiction possibly, and that's what we want to debate today to kick us off, is not only our experiences with Jaws and how we got into it, but also how do we reconcile, as shark advocates, this, what I think is a fantastic movie, but portrays great whites in such a way, a negative way, and had such an impact on great whites, as we all know the history and legacy of Jaws and how it put great white sharks as the, the big monster into the mainstream you know, and, and cause such such damage. How do we reconcile that with the fact that we love the movie? It's such a cool movie. I mean, I'm a Spielberg fan. As a filmmaker, I've studied that film so many times and you can go into all the trivia and debate and the discussion and we will do some of that today. But I want to talk to everybody here, all the admins and for you guys, the listeners, about how we reconcile as shark advocates the, the damage and impact that Jaws did. And if that movie came out today... And you see all these cheesy movies come out today and it was called, you know, Killer Jaws, then we'd, we'd boycott it in a second. We wouldn't even give it the time of day. So why do we still love Jaws? And is it OK to love Jaws as a shark advocate? And firstly, I want to turn over to uh, Javier, who, Javier, you've got something you want to read us? Yes, sir, I do. Let me throw this out there for everybody. And you guys are going to tell me if what I'm going to read now is real life or from the movie Jaws. That's it. Here we go. Despite the death of the victim and the report of large shark having been caught in the vicinity, I do not believe there is any reason why people should hesitate to go in swimming at the beaches for fear of a man eater. Is this real life or this is the movie Jaws? Let's ask Anna first, because Anna, Jaws is your favorite movie. I would say that's I would say that's real. That would be correct. That's actually from the Jersey Shore, well, this beach would be would have been Haven Beach. Beach Haven. Beach Haven, correct. Yes. That was the the one of the officials from the area, actually. The, and the true statement goes like this: It's just funny how it, it reminds us of the movie Just Right, because despite the death of Mr. Charles Van Sant and the report of two sharks having been caught in the vicinity recently, I do not believe there is any reason why people should hesitate to go in swimming at the beaches for fear of the man-eater. So really, I didn't change much the context. I changed the victim. Did the official who said it wear a really bad suit with anchors on? <laughs> <laughs> Larry, Larry, if we make an effort today, oh, we might man. be able to save August. August? For Christ's sake, tomorrow's the 4th of July, and we will be open for business. 
is going to be one of the best summers we've ever had. Now, if you fellas are concerned about the beaches, you do whatever you have to to make them safe. But those beaches will be open for this weekend. Um, I actually think that that statement might have been made by the researcher uh, Schroeder. At that time, we really didn't have any negative shark incidents. You know, people didn't fear these animals at this time. They knew that they were there. But there was no embedded fear. So do we think that Jaws as a movie, I mean, Drew, if I can ask you you this, do you think Jaws as a movie still has a negative impact on how we look at sharks and how it changed the sort of the pop culture of how we see sharks? Uh, I think it's hard to do that. The hindsight is twenty twenty thing. I think looking back on it and saying, you know, the does it still have a negative impact on sharks? I don't really think so. I think there's there's enough shark information out there now. It's almost just like an echo at this point in time. There's so much other stuff out there. You know, back when Jaws came out, it was pretty much the only thing anybody was hearing about sharks. And it became that huge master phenomenon. And I think had there been a shark week or something like that, it wouldn't have had the impact that it does now. I mean, sharks were still relatively unknown outside of science back then. So I really think that uh, the impact of of Jaws today is is minimal. I agree. Anna, if I could ask you, when we talk about shows like Shark Week, although the presentation has changed and Shark Week week itself has evolved quite a lot since it first started. Do you still think that the portrayal of the great white shark particularly has really changed that much since those days? No, not really. Yeah, I mean, just look at the words that they use to describe their episodes. Yes. They're still using the iconic Jaws movie theme to bring in viewers, mm-hmm. to, to create that thriller slash horror tension and to bring people in. And that doesn't help. The jaw gaping, always trying to get these animals to behave in a predatory manner. I often say these animals sell themselves. We don't need to see them being baited or uh, attacking boats or doing these silly little things. You can just stick a camera in there and watch this animal swim. It will sell itself. If you look at the the movie Jaws per se, I mean, when it came out, it was actually, I don't know if you guys knew this, but it was actually inspired by a real shark back in 1916 in New Jersey. Yes. The residents there locally actually uh, engaged um, like an action of hunting a shark that killed four people, including a 10-year-old boy. So it's a very interesting how it kind of evolved from, you know, early days to the first iconic movie. You know, Jaws, it really propels great white sharks into literally the limelight. Love it or hate it, it's brought all this awareness about sharks. You know, if this movie was made today in its current kind of a format, you would junk it. It's, it you know, wouldn't be anything to, to write home about. But because really at, those, at that time, it was so different and it really brought in this fear from the deep in a way. What was her name? Little Chrissy, I think. And Chrissy was swimming, uh, skinny dipping the buoy uh, incident. And that really just brought everything home. I mean, like it kind of just like, you know, you were spellbound literally watching this movie from then onwards. I, you know, although it's had such a negative connotation with sharks, I believe that it did start off the role in terms of actually trying to understand sharks in a better light. And certainly it changed my insight as well, because in those days when I saw my first white in open water, I thought I was dead. I mean, I thought we were going to be, uh, we were going to be chum and this is it. And, uh, you know, at the end of the, the days, because again, of, of the stereotypic belief that we were, you know, made to believe you know since obviously we've evolved tremendously and i really welcome that but i think jaws has been a such a such a game changer in terms of actually the awareness of shocks and i don't know if you guys agree with it definitely 100 percent. i agree with you and, and i think even if you look at what happened during the t- that time period right around when jaws came out a little bit before the first real shark documentary came out which was blue water white Best death ever. Mm. If you look at the treatment of the white sharks in that compared to how Jaws treats uh, white sharks, it's night and day. It really is a complete 180. Yeah, I agree. Shark Week, I think, just dramatizes every emotion that the movie brought forth. Yep. You watch some of these episodes and it's like Melissa said, it's, you know, it's the gaping mouth. It's all about the teeth. Very extreme close-ups of the mouth. Listen to the music that they play. Mm-hmm. The, the, whoever is narrating, you know, they, they often have the dramatic gravelly voice. And, and Wow, that's really good. <laughs> maybe I can hire off for commercials now. <laughs> but they go over the top. Yeah, we need to take our hat off to John Williams, though. Yes, for that. Oh, I mean, 
I mean, it's iconic. It's there's there's nothing that quite matches that 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 sound. There was a a British death metal thrash metal band that did a cover version of the Jaws music, uh, which basically played it on like heavy metal guitars, <laughs> yes. and got faster and faster and faster until at the end they just shouted "swim like." <laughs> Funny. But you're right. The the music. If you've ever seen the movie Halloween that John Carpenter made, yeah. and he made that for a very small amount of money, and he put it to the studio, and they said it was trash. It wasn't scary. And then all he did was take the same film back and put his music on top. Very simple, you know, kind of music, and handed it back, and they went, "Wow, we don't know what you've re-edited, but this is like so scary now." Wow. And it was the same with Jaws. I think that that opening of Jaws, where you've got. Uh, just the underwater shot, uh, you know, on the floor of the ocean and that, and that, duh, duh, you know, we all know the music because everybody does it. But of yeah. course. Drew is spotting the money. He tapped into something there. And I often wonder, would Jaws have had the impact that it had? And would it still have the impact have if it wasn't for John Williams' music? Every movie without the music that they put into the music would never be the, that type of movie. Obviously, Star Wars, Jaws, Indiana Jones, any movie you could mention, even the stupidest movie in the world. The music's going to make a difference on how that movie's going to go. The, the smartest thing you could do is put the perfect music to a, a movie that you're going to have a, a, a killer, in this in this instance, a shark, a rogue shark. And then you have the, the shots of the swimmers, which I, I always laugh because I don't remember going to the beach and seeing people just th uh, threading on water, like everybody threading on water in the deep end. I've never seen that in the beach. I, I'm sorry. And then they show from the bottom of the ocean, you see the shark kind of like all their little legs. Uh, stretching and all the kids, everybody having fun. Come on, man. Who who do, who who threads for an hour? You swim for a little bit. You come back. You rest up. So it's just perfect. The music and those kind of shots it is so like inviting for anybody that just wants to get scared and want to. And what, that's what the director and that's what the the books. That's what that's what they wanted to accomplish. And they did a magnificent job accomplishing what they wanted. I'll tell you who goes out treading water for an hour: the little kitna boy. And look where it got him. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> his mother told him that his fingers were pruning and he should have got out of the water, but he didn't listen, <laughs> did he? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I think Anna's spot on the money again that you watch Shark Week now. Dirk, I think you said in the last episode that the media still hates sharks and loves sharks because they love them because it gets the ratings. They hate them because of the way that, you know, they still portray them negatively. But like Anna's just said, the music on Shark Week, although it's not the Jaws music, still has to go the route of, you know, the hyped up drama. And I just, yeah, Jaws did that to a T. But then Jaws also did some really positive, when they're hitting the barrels on the shark and the orca's speeding out and, you know, and the, that music there is just like, I want to be on that boat. This looks fantastic, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's one of my favorite scenes. Yeah, Absolutely. cinematically, is when you see the reflection of the barrels yep. in the windows of the orca, and Brody is standing right behind. Yeah, awesome, beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Yeah, that's you know that is just showing you know again John Williams is a master for using those kind of music. Uh, Bruce Bumps. beautiful. Incidentally, by the way, I have to get out of the way because I've never mentioned this before. I did actually name my second child Brody after Chief Brody. <laughs> no kidding. No kidding. Oh, that's great. Because oh, I was just gonna say that I think the music enhances the movie. Yes. yes. I don't think if you didn't have that music, I think the movie would still be just as frightening. Absolutely. For the first what half of the movie, you really didn't see the shark. Yeah. yeah. It was all about in the, the depths, the unknown. You never saw the shark when it took Chrissy. We all know fear sells, yeah. whether it's a headline for an article or it's the music in the background, fear sells in the end. We didn't see the same reaction to the film Orca. Does anybody remember the film Orca? Oh, yeah, I do. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy, did that scare the bejesus out of me. Uh, you know what I mean? This rogue mom coming and hunting everybody down. And, and it, that definitely didn't get the same attention as Jaws. And that one took Bo, Bo Derek's leg off, too. You know why? Go on. SeaWorld is why you didn't you didn't have that same uh -huh. yeah possibly you're, you're talking about the, the killer whales that that jump and play with the ball and jump through the hoop and everything at SeaWorld. I agree with that, but I also think that on Orca, no matter how vicious they are, they could be not to human necessarily have been, have been uh, historically, but the way that they do what they do with their prey is they're so freaking amazing. Or the way they do, but 
nobody ever is going to see, like the same way they don't see a lion as a big freaking man eater. And they eat more, 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 more humans than any shark would in years. Yeah. Or it's just a matter that the shark is just a different allure. I'm sorry. It just shark has this mysteriousness. And thanks to everybody portraying it as, as killers. And it's easy for them to make, do some research and understand the science and the math. And, and and the statistics, but people just like to go into the that's and that's why Shark Week work because that's what people want to get attracted to instead of just the the real science of shark. Mm-hmm. If you know the story between Jaws and Orca, Richard Harris and the rest of his crew, even Bo Derek, brought that creature's ire down upon them as opposed to Jaws, which Bruce or or whatever mm-hmm. you want to call him, he he sort of invaded their territory. But in in the in the movie Orca, they had actually killed another Orca and then the baby. So that's what. So that's why I think you're not quite getting the same horror because it was revenge. Exactly. It was quite terrifying to me as a child. Oh, of course. Oh, yeah. Actually, next weekend here in New Jersey at the Blue Claws Stadium, which is a very family-friendly um, minor league baseball stadium here, they're actually showcasing Jaws. And you're going to have hundreds and hundreds of families bringing their children to view it. And I I, I think that's rather positive. There's a thing, because I, I talked to Dirk on the last episode about how I got into shots and that Jaws was the first movie I saw. So I while I don't want to recount that tale, I've recently just watched uh, like the 4K Ultra HD remaster. It looks spectacular. Mm-hmm. But I was watching, and I'm sat there, th- I think it's got a, like a 12 rating in, in the UK. I don't know what the, the US equivalent would be. But I was watching, you know, you've got you've got some quite gruesome stuff, like when they're, they're in the pond and the little guys, you know, hey, guys, are you okay over there? And then the shark knocks him out of the boat. Next thing you see is this. The arm, the leg. Hey, guys. You guys okay over there? That's still pretty gruesome, to be fair, even though you, you kind of know it's a prop. It's not a kid's movie. No, but you're going to see multiple families bringing their children to view this film. That stadium will be packed. Mm. Yes, of course. Even though we may view it one way, others don't quite view it the same way. I guess not everybody sees it as a um, a movie that portrays them in a bad light or, or maybe... Like, I was raised in a household where we were told, okay, this is fake, it isn't real. Yeah, I was told that as well, but then I also saw a trout in the local river and <laughs> thought it was probably a baby shark and it was going to eat me. I was terrified. <laughs> it's a true story. Um, I was going to ask, um, Anna, when you actually watch Jaws, do you have any any thought at all about your interest and your advocacy for sharks now when you watch Jaws, or do you purely just shut off and watch it as a movie? I just watch it as a movie. I've had people ask me, uh, how can you possibly like Jaws when you're, you know, you advocate for sharks? It's like, well, because I can tell the difference between fantasy and reality. I can appreciate something as entertainment, as a movie, but still know what I need to do in real life. Yeah, I agree. Hmm. So I, I can enjoy it for what it is. It was meant to be a thriller slash horror movie in 1975. That, that's all it was meant to be. And that's how I look at it when I watch it now. It's really no different than like the movie Lake Placid. And we all sat back and we laughed at the the senior citizen feeding the babies. And I really do feel that a lot of people can view it in that light, like Anna saying. Ah, but, but there's a difference there. So Lake Placid, you can easily see that as fantasy because it was about a mutated giant alligator. Whereas the shark, nobody had, nobody had the knowledge when this film came out of and still a lot don't now, of the reality of white sharks. So what they told you in that movie, you know, he's 25 foot, you know, three tons of him, and, you know, even silly lines like Quint say, I saw one eat a rocking chair one time, and people like, this is, people took that as fact. People yeah. took that as education on white sharks because you didn't have any further input. Whereas Lake Placid is like some genetically mutated giant alligator. People have seen alligators probably, you know, more than... And no, understand those more than sharks. Is is that not fair to say? Yeah. Then it comes down to the individual wanting to educate themselves after the fact. 
Yes. And honestly, gators are pretty formative themselves. Very formative. <laughs> yeah. uh, I fear them. You won't catch me walking next to the edge of a lake in Florida. I won't even stick my feet in fresh water in Florida after living there. I fear them way more than I'll ever fear a shark. I agree 100%. For me, when I saw the movie, I was nine. I was enamored with anything ocean related. I mean, I live in Michigan, for God's sakes. So it was very, ooh, ah, you know, otherworldly to me. Yeah. But in the movie scared the shit out of me. I still, to this day, silly as it is, in fresh water, will not swim out so far that I can't put my feet on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It oh, just yeah. freaks me out. Had that it effect. Freaks me out. Yeah. But I mean, look, of course, look at what the movie did at the time. People stayed away from the beach. Oh, yeah. People would not go swimming. Me and my girlfriend were afraid when we would swim in her pool as it got dark. If it got dark, it was like we were out of the pool. Can't, can't yeah. do it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, hi, Larry. Why aren't you in the water? Uh, well, uh, I just put some suntan lotion on, and uh, I'm trying to absorb Nobody's some of this going sun. in. Please, get in the water. Like you all said, there wasn't a whole lot of information out there about sharks unless you were in the scientific community. But when the movie came out, kids like me that were thought the ocean was just this magic place. This movie, it just opened uh, an entire world because all of a sudden it was sharks everywhere. You could go to the supermarket and hit the magazine rack and there were just tons and tons of magazines about sharks, of course, shark attacks, but all the information was there. And that's how I got, I got drawn in as I said, oh my God, I love this monster. But then I started to, keep, to buy the magazines and that started me going to the library yeah. And, you know, checking out books, everything on TV, then it was Ron and Bale Taylor. Mm. The yeah. only thing that I could consume it'd be a book or television about sharks, I was all in. But So it, it inspired a passion and it, it, it woke me up to what's out there, which led me to pursue educating myself about what's real and what's not. Mm -hmm. It's funny that you said that because until the Jaws mania happened, most people the worldwide looked at sharks as a nuisance more than anything else. You know, if you talk about whalers, whalers used to sit there and, and drive them crazy because the sharks would travel and, and bring them back to the whaling stations. They'd bring the sharks back to the whaling stations. These things just keep eating our fish off the line. Nobody cared about sharks until the hysteria started. Yeah. And then that's when the heroism started, the, the false bravado and that sort of thing. So it became a chance for especially fishermen who had seen sharks on a regular basis before, all of a sudden they, they seized their moment to say, now I can be a hero because here's this thing that I didn't care about last week, and now I can go out and kill it and get my name in the paper, turn the whole working class hero thing going on. I mean, that's a, that's, that, I'm kind of quoting yeah. Cooper there, but, <laughs> um, but that's, that's pretty much the, the way it happened. Give me your hands. Dogfish. You got a $5,000 net. You got $2,000 worth of fishing. And along comes Mr. Whitey. By the time he's finished with that net, looks like a kitty scissor class has cut it up for a paper doll. You got city hands, Mr. Hooper. You've been counting money all your life. All right, all right. All right. Hey, I don't need this. I don't need this working class hero crap. You, you, you're not going to do this aboard the ship, are you, Mr. Quinn? Maybe I should go alone. Even as far back as like the, the 1800s, sailors would make note of, of sharks as just the scavengers of the sea, like, like they actually are. They became supernatural uh, after Benchley and Spielberg. Yeah, I guess I grew up a little bit different because here on the Northeast in New Jersey, um, when I was a kid, we used to go to a beach called Beacon Beach in Point Pleasant Beach. If a shark entered the area and was noticed by the lifeguard, they would literally go out, tail rope it, and drag it up onto the beach. My neighbor across the street from me, he had one of those sloping front lawns that we used to be able to ride sleds down when it snowed. He would cover his front lawn with multiple species of sharks. So for me, I actually saw them kind of in a weaker light than others did. So maybe that's why my opinion's a little different. That's interesting. Mundus was also going out of our inlet here, Manasquan Inlet, and he was also going out of Montauk, New York. Um, he was doing that with researcher Jack Casey. As a child, we used to take class trips over to where Jack Casey worked. That's where my interest started, of course, with Jaws and then questioning what sharks we have in the area. So we were exposed, I guess you could say, because I lived in a fishing community. I was exposed to these animals. Yeah. And I really wasn't raised to fear them. Like I said, um, if anything, 
I saw multiple dead sharks. So, you know, it was a little bit different. I'm not going to lie. There were times that when you went past the surf, and you were out there treading. Yes, we do tread on water here in New Jersey. <laughs> and uh, when you finally get past the break, and it's a pretty good workout, you do sit and tread for a little while. And if you're by yourself, I'd be a liar to say that I never had that feeling inside, like something's with me. It was a different light. Like I said, if, if one came into the bathing area, the lifeguards would literally go out there and just tail rope it and drag it in. I This was normal behavior. Wow to witness in the early 80s here in New Jersey. I didn't have an embedded fear. Let's put it that way. There's a contrast to that. Yes. Dirk, in South Africa, because you grew up in Durban. Yes, correct. What was the impact in South Africa? Sharks are literally on your doorstep, you know, all manner of sharks. What was the impact, do you remember, in, in a different country like that when Jaws came out? Well, uh, in Durban is obviously a surfing town, so there's a lot of surfers around. I mean, we were like, whoa, you know what I mean? Like, you don't really see that kind of a shark because it was such atypical behavior normally as well. I mean, these shark attacks are rare, uh, even then, with or without shark nets. And a great part in those days was, you know, who's ever seen a great white? I mean, it was just an unknown shark you know, for, for many of us. I mean, we saw bull sharks and we saw sand tigers and hammerheads and you know, a whole host of other sharks, but never a great white. It really brought the great white shark as a species really into into the forefront. Sure, everybody was much more cautious about it. And maybe, you know, you kind of got a weird feeling you just left the water, you know, because yeah, you never know. But after a couple of days, I mean, you know, nothing happens and you just get back in the water and, and off you go. If the divers amongst us, when you go diving, I mean, you know that you are focusing normally on the sea floor or crevices and so forth in terms of what you can see and when that movie cuts in in terms of like when people are diving and and seaweeds going around and so forth that is a typical dive and and you're kind of now thinking well as i'm diving what's watching me i've got fun turning around and, and seeing what's around me more than actually what's always on the sea floor and uh, you know often you can see a shark just like cruising by just in like in visual range and you think hey the shark's gonna come around and it just kind of leaves again so this whole jaws movie brought a lot of these factors together from both swimmers people that use their water users and, and divers alike. In South Africa, people were wary for a while, but uh, you know, in, in the early days, in those, a, a good shark was a dead shark. These bravado guys were out there with their power heads. They used to swim up to a nurse shark and like, you know, you know, power head in the head or something like that and then drag it to shore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were the, the heroes of the day. That's the kind of a effect it kind of brought about there was this like backlash in a way in terms of a good shark with a dead shark was a movie ultimate portrays between good and evil you know the evil being the shark in this case and the good being obviously Bruce Schneider with, uh, with his, his final fatal bullet to to, to Bruce I, I know I'm digressing on this and I just want to ask you guys uh, Jaws if you take it from a gender do you think it was a male shark or a female shark was that something that puzzled me throughout the movie, movie as well female mm, no <laughs> definitely a female Hi. Well, one, the size, females are larger, two, the attitude. And uh, considering that she was a Northwest Atlantic girl, that would mean uh, she was probably a Jersey girl, <laughs> considering we have the only documented uh, white shark nursery in the Northwest Atlantic. I think Drew has some science for us. Drew, have you got some science for us here? I, I wouldn't say it's actually science, but I thought it would be something I'd like to bring up just because it's something that a lot of people don't consider. But try to watch Jaws in a different perspective the next time around. Because I'll be honest with you, if you if you really take a close look at it, I think you'll find out that between Spielberg and Benchley, they were actually making the people uh, and, and people's hysteria to be the bad guy in the film. So if you get a chance to watch it again, the shark is a problem, but you've got, you know, you've got the mayor who's saying, you know, we're not going to close down. We're going to put everybody in danger because we need to make money. Everybody just sort of runs to the shore because despite everything that's happened, they're, they're not willing to, to sacrifice their vacation time. Those tourist dollars. Mm -hmm. And ever since I, ever since I saw that, or I, I, I heard it somewhere, I believe it was Peter Benchley was talking about it. He didn't, he didn't make it out to be that people are the bad guy, but society was unwilling to it was their mistakes that led to all the problems, really, except for maybe perhaps Chrissy Watkins' death. Um, but yeah, if you get a chance to watch it again under a different a different mindset, and I think you'd be really surprised. Even Chrissy, I mean, what was Chrissy doing? She obviously she was slightly drunk, but she went out at the wrong time of day. Correct. And she basically went out on her own into into deeper water. So it's interesting because the book is very much more. I found more people focused. Yes. Yes. Even the subplot in the in the book about, you know, Brody's wife having an affair with Hooper. Obviously that was taken out for the for the movie and probably the better for it. But again, so much of the book was about the people. That's a really interesting observation. I've never really thought about it that way to be fair. Are you going to close the beaches? 
Yes, we are. We're also planning to bring in some experts from the Oceanographic Institute on the mainland. Only 24 hours. I didn't agree to that. Only 24 hours. Adding to what Drew was saying before, when I watched Just the first time, it was the first time I was 10. So I was like, wow. But I didn't really capture the movie as a whole. I just saw a movie, entertaining movie, scary movie. Mm-hmm. I love the shark part of it. The second time that I saw Just, that's when I started paying attention to detail, which was maybe like two years after that. I was 12 the second time I saw it. At that time, the, we didn't have that much access to watch that movie unless somebody had the video cassette. And it wasn't as easy as just watching it now anytime that you want to stream it anywhere. When I watched it the second time, I remember that right away I started feeling bad for the shark, right? And I don't know why. I didn't know why I was feeling this way. I couldn't stand the people. To me, the people were so snobbish, so full of themselves. And I'm 12 years old. I'm here trying to like comprehend these people being so like only thinking about themselves and they're not thinking about the whole thing. That, and when I started seeing the footage of Ronan Balbi Taylor with the real shark on the water shot, that's when I realized the difference between the real shark and the fake shark in the movie. Yeah. And I, I could tell apart, I go, that's when I fell in love for real with the shark. And yeah. that's when I realized that to me, from then on, even though I know the shark, or can I add that at the end, no matter what? And I love Brody. But I was going always for the shark, always for the shark. Well, yeah, when you see the contrast of the the fake shark and those and the real shark footage, it clearly was, you know, you could tell the real shark even as a kid. Oh, yeah. But interestingly, having stood on top of a boat in South Africa and watched a white shark five meter come towards the boat, dive down underneath the boat and come out the other side, and then watch that shot in Jaws, to say that that is a, a rubber shark or a fake shark, that actually looks, that is pretty convincing. Even It's only when the shark's out of the water in the film that it starts mm-hmm. looking ridiculously cheesy and of its time. But those underwater shots where it's like swimming past the edge of the boat, they're not a million miles away from how it actually looks when you're out on a boat. Yeah. But it's only then, like you say, that you then put the real footage in, which I believe I was, again, I don't know, Anna, you probably know this if you've seen it a million times and know the trivia lot, that they put a um, a small person in a small cage on those shots to make the, the shark look even bigger than it actually was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's funny because if, apparently that, that little, uh, apparently they didn't tell that guy exactly what he was in. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I remember seeing it. So, so he was he was just absolutely, you know, furious wow. by the time they were done with the shooting. <laughs> that idea again that modern media and modern TV and modern film when you're talking about the bravado of South African men going out there and you know and killing sharks and dragging them back and being like the hero well I kind of see the same thing they're just holding 4k cameras now and going out doing it on national TV mm-hmm. you know it, it's still to me and this is where I, I do struggle probably less with Jaws as a movie maybe because of the age, but certainly with the that portrayal of sharks that way, I find it, I do find it, I just struggle to separate it as much. Maybe some of you guys do, because I still think that that negative perception, the ego of the people hunting a shark, I mean, Shark Week, they make entire shows about exactly the same thing. Yes. Going out hunting a shark. Yes. They're just sticking cameras in it. I, I, I really struggle to separate the two, even though I do love the movie. And they do, let's be honest here, they do use some fishing practices to get some of the footage. Of course, they have to. They have. To think that there's never a hook used in these situations would be ignorant on the part of the viewer. I agree. There's definitely more behind what you're viewing than what's portrayed. First of all, like uh, Jaws was the first non-picture book I ever read. I read it as a kid and I didn't even understand it. That's why when you said the part about uh, Brody's wife and, and Hooper having an affair. I didn't understand what that meant when I first read it because I couldn't. I didn't understand why why Hooper was making faces and stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, if you look if you look back, there's some despicable parts in there, especially with as far as Quint goes. Because now I don't want to spoil anything. I think you're okay. I think we're past the spoilers, okay. Drew. <laughs> okay, you'll be fine. Right, right. But you you never know. I mean, I've I've got three versions of the of the hard hard copy on my on my shelf. Okay, here. spoiler alert. If you look at in the in the book what quint uses as bait at the end it's really something that that really is unsettling especially for somebody like me who studies you know what i study if you're if you're curious at all look it up because uh th- that was traumatizing to me as a kid mm. it really was i thought it upsetting too i never read the book so you're gonna have to fill me in don't Drew. read the book i hated the book i'm not reading the book Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. I'll, I'll, yes, let me know later. <laughs> you all know me. 
know how I earn a living. I'll catch this bird for you, but it ain't gonna be easy. It's a bad fish. It's not like going down the pond chasing bluegills or tommy cards. This shark swallow you whole. Shaking, tenderizing. Down you go. And we gotta do it quick. That'll bring back the tourists. That'll put all your businesses on a paying basis. But it's not gonna be pleasant. I value my neck a lot more than 3,000 bucks, Chief. I'll find him for three, but I'll catch him and kill him for 10. And you gotta make up your minds. You wanna stay alive and ante up? You wanna play it cheap? Be on welfare the whole winter. I don't want no volunteers. I don't want no mates. There's too many captains on this island. The book is very different. I mean, to me, that shows the the genius of Steven Spielberg in his craft. You know, everybody talks about it obviously came from Peter Benchley's book, but you cannot deny Spielberg's absolute magic as a filmmaker to make that work. Oh, yeah. I just think that people have been riding on the coattails of that for, for decades ever since and still want to be. People look at Quint and, yeah, in the in the book, he's a deplorable character. In the, in the film, he's, you know, he is what he is. He's a mixed bag. But people still want to be the big shark man. Yeah. People still want to be the guy they turn to to go get that shark. He's supposed to be like the hero, right? Even though he turns out not to be the hero, but that's what they kind of portray him as. He's the man, the macho. Because Brody is like a, that, like a very, doesn't even like the water. He's very like, very subdued and suddenly he has to come out from all this bravado from inside and, and let it all out because nobody wants to listen to him and it's one of those things that you have to put in perspective what that's why it's such a fantastic piece of filmmaking to this day and that's why he just he just wanted to protect his kids he wanted to protect the people protect the kids yeah that's his only that's only he care about his family if you really look at it then they're you know of course then you're the police chief so you have to protect the island obviously but it just it shows you how what a great piece of filmmaking that is just because how they portrayed all, all those different characters and you could decide who's the good and the bad guy is at the end no matter who because it, they does it such a man difficult way like uh, Spielberg does such a great job doing that and the way they wrote the script that's why I wouldn't care I wouldn't care about reading the book now because I want to remember the movie as I saw it and the way it is now I don't want to change anything I don't care about Hooper having an affair I don't care about Brody having an affair with a, with somebody else. I don't care. I don't want to know anything different that I already know. From he has the an affair with the shark in the book. Uh, <laughs> <have> you, uh, <laughs> but even those three characters that still, again, just to draw comparisons to modern day, obviously, so you've got, you know, that real sort of conflict between Quint, the working man, who works with sharks, and then you've got Hooper, the scientist, who studies in the academic. Yeah. We see that all the time, mm -hmm. as, you oh, know, yeah. the si oh, yeah. science versus anecdotal and how, you know, a scientist will very quickly, a marine biologist can say, well, you know, again, I'd cite somebody like, you know, Rob Lawrence, who we had on a few episodes back, who's probably seen more white sharks than, than most people will ever, ever, ever see, even on TV, and understands them and knows their nature. And, yeah. and yet he hasn't studied that from an academic point of view, mm -hmm. and yet an academic can easily shut that down and go, well, that's not science, that's anecdotal. Even that still plays out as, you know, as character traits now. Absolutely. Yeah. To this day, researchers use fishermen to help them. They they basically work side by side. Uh, you see that with Keith Poe. You see it with Chip Michalov. We have quite a few teams out there that work with researchers. So that part of the portrayal is pretty true. And honestly, Benchley used to go out on trips with Mundus and Jack Casey. Yep. A, a lot of it, there is some truth behind some of the movie. And if you look deeper into it, you know, you'll wind up feeling bad for sharks. You will. Yeah. If, if you yeah. look back, if you go back to what um, spurred the thoughts behind this movie, which was the 1916 shark attacks, from that time on, we actually had one of the largest animal hunts in history. Yeah that went on for years. A majority of the species that we see today only were afforded protection in the 90s. There is some truth behind it. And if you do look further than the movie and you look back into where the thought process came from to create a movie like this, you'll see that, you know, sharks were definitely the victims in the end. Since you mentioned uh, Mitchell up and you mentioned Keith Bowe, let's not 
ignore the possibility of bringing this subject up because I'm sure our members are going to love hearing me say this, but oh, search. Yeah. They're all fishermen. That's all yes. they are. They're fishermen and they partner with the scientists. So exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what they are. All they are is the fishermen who go out. They're Quint. They're basically Quint is what it Actually, is. Actually, so. Chris Fisher is a spot burner, but basically a spot burner is somebody who comes out and steals your spot. He's done this multiple times to anglers. Some are wiser now and no longer work with them because of it. But um, a lot of times their spots are are stolen from another guy who spent 20, 30 years working an area. They, I guess you could say, were swayed by the power of O Search <laughs> or the popularity, and they bring them in. You're you're having this in Nova Scotia right now. It's quite offensive because the actual angler who did the work, who put the time in, is unknown to O Search's followers in the end. Do the scientists who, who partner with these fishermen for anybody who's in the know, because it's not an area I have much experience with, do they compete? The, is the ego at play between those again as to whether the science is king or whether working with these animals is king does that actually exist on on board i'm gonna say yes they're not allowed to say because of the non-disclosure agreements <laughs> yeah well i will say this there's some pretty big egos in the shark world you know it's definitely a shark eat shark world nah. <laughs> out there and not only are the fishermen in competition with each other but the researchers are also in competition with each other. Oh, yeah. Heavily. Dirty, dirty, dirty. Very dirty. Uh, shark politics are pretty ugly when you get down to the nitty gritty. Who gets hurt at the end? The shark. Exactly. You know, you need to understand that fishermen, and I, that's one thing I learned while I was in this group back in the day, talking to people that educated me because I was in the, in the side that, I know that I hated fishermen, but I couldn't stand anybody messing with sharks, right? I had, finally, I was educated enough from fishermen that took the time to educate me, not by putting me down, but by taking me aside, go, hey, this is how it works. And, and I started observing also, you see my own brain, to understand that this tagging people, it wouldn't have it without the fishermen. Fishermen are so essential to to the shark population, to the shark scientists, because they're, they are there every effing day. Yes. And they've seen the sharks without having to bait them because they go to places that sharks are going to be going through those channels to because it's a Gulf Stream or it's what in the Gulf, whatever. You're going to see these animals in their natural habitat. And it's just one of those things that, you know, people have to understand that fishermen sometimes are going to be portrayed as bad people because of movies, too. Yes. But it, it, until you start reading, and that's why it's so important for people to you have to you have to be take the time and be responsible for the information you look for because some people just go by what somebody says, what they read in one post, and they go, okay, you know, okay, that's it, I, I'm I'm done with this. I believe this person, and I'm out of here. Come on, man, be responsible and do the research, read a little more, and you'll be surprised. Yeah, how wrong you're being as so many about so many things like I have learned the hard way and the easy way. I often say fishermen are not created equally. They're all very different, different techniques. Once you have an educated eye, you can definitely differentiate one from the other. Correct. Speaking of an eye, just to bring this back to Jaws a second, the, scare, <laughs> the scariest thing I found watching Jaws was when when the guy's head pops out of the boat. Yes. <laughs> when Hooper goes down to him with his, with his eye missing. Uh, bump guard, bump guard. I always thought to myself, how the hell did this massive shark take his eye out? Or was that the, did the crab get him afterwards? Drew? Or the fish? Drew, yeah, Drew, can we get some science, please? Drew, go ahead, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's funny you mentioned that because that, that's one of the things that popped in my head as a kid. I was sitting there going, like, you know, how can this thing... No, no pun intended, right? No pun intended. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but uh, you you kind of wonder, like, how, how they do it. But again, it was that was more for the Hollywood thrill than anything else. Well, that know? was added so, in afterwards, um, wasn't it? They went and actually shot that yeah, in the swimming pool yeah. just to add an extra bit of gore and jump scare, but... You know, yeah, and somebody I saw a collector still has that head somewhere. It's funny. Wow. To this day, I still watch Jaws, and that's the only part of the movie, believe it or not, that I still want to turn around and I don't want to see it happen. <laughs> I still get scared. I don't like that part. I don't like that part at all. And I know it's coming, and that's the sad part. I know it's coming, but I'm going, I don't gonna look. I don't want to look again. And there's a freaking head with the eye down, and, and the guy screaming. I go, yeah. I'm the same way. I'll tell you what, I've, I've seen this, I've seen that movie. I don't, God knows how many times by now, but I'll tell you that the spot that still gets me to jump because I still can't predict when it's going to happen is when the shark hits the cage from behind. Yeah. I never, <laughs> yeah. I never yeah. have that time to write. I always jump out that part. I 
And we all know, Dirk, I believe you you uh, you get a box of tissues and shed a tear <laughs> when Pippet goes. <laughs> but I always wondered, like, you know, what happened to Pippet? I mean, like, uh, you know, was it, was she just an extra and then forgotten or something, you know? Oh, I'm sure they're saving it for Jaws 5 sequel or it's a prequel <laughs> oh, now. Um, don't, mention, don't mention those, please. Don't mention those. You saw what they did in the Meg, right? You saw that they did the, they did the exact same thing with with Meg. They had a dog named Pippa. The it? Meg is a good example. I mean, oh, don't get me started on Megalodon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's a that's a whole other. <laughs> the the thing is with with the Meg, and I know that came from again a series of books. I've I've read that and a couple of others. I personally don't rate them. People still want that same image of a shark, and it's like, okay, we know about great whites. We see them a lot now. We still have the fear thing, but we need them bigger. Yeah, still mm-hmm. need them bigger. You you know? So how do you guys feel when they dragged out? Uh, remember, they went then onto a shark hunt and they pulled out uh, another another shark, um, pretending it was tiger. Yeah. Now that was actually a real shark. They that was not a prop. Yeah. They actually yes. killed a real shark for for the movie. In for the case. movie. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. 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 So I always thought that was a really good prosthetic for for that era, but I did not know that was real. Yeah. When I found out, I was really pissed off. If you look at the mouth, it's only got like one, uh, one yep. tooth left yep. in its mouth. I've, I've they always removed the whole jaw. Right? That, oh, that's true. That's right. I forgot about that. You took Thank the jaw out, yeah. yeah? Yeah. Wow. You'd like to prove that, wouldn't you? Get your name in the National Geographic. <laughs> what is this bite radius <laughs> crap? That is a big mouth. Look at all it. I'm going to stuff your friggin' head in there, man, and find out if it's a man. All right? Come on. I had no idea they actually removed the jaw of the animal. I just figured the fishing line knocked its teeth out. Maybe it was on a long line or something of that nature. All I know is that if you watch that shot, you'll see one tooth in that shark's mouth. One tooth. Yes. So they actually killed the shark for the movie? Or... That's what I read, too. Yes, they did. Yeah. Oh, okay. See, wow. in a modern era, that would be subject to cancel culture and people would be boycotting the film and, you Correct. know, shutting it down now. Oh, yeah, of course. Well, I guess it was a different time. You know, it was the 70s. I've always wondered about that doc scene, though, when they go and finish dinner and then they go and cut the the shark open and you see all the all the white fluid coming out can someone explain that white fluid to someone who doesn't know like me i, I can tell you because that, that's actually that's actually fairly accurate um i mean i've, I've done a lot of sharks di- dissections and stuff it's not necessarily white fluid but there's there's a fluid in there in the body cavity that holds everything in shape you really won't get a lot of blood if you, if you get the shark open and again i apologize to the the listeners who were, who were sitting there going like oh you slaughter shark no all the sharks i get have, have come to me already dead so <laughs> i have not killed anything i don't want be quint but um yeah i mean it's honestly uh when you when you cut it open there's there's a whole bunch of fluid will come out and then that's when you see it and and you'll realize that the internal anatomy of a shark is very simple very it's just like one straight shot and there's this giant liver in there with three lobes on it and everything so so yeah that was actually fairly accurate to be honest i was actually blown away with um how little there is to the anatomy of the animal i as a kid that scene again used to sort of disturb me more than the shark scenes just, I guess it was the way it was acted and the way they sold it with the smell. I mean, you know, uh-huh. they're out there on the dock cutting it open, the fluid's coming out and they're tossing these bits of fish and a license plate. and From the golf, getting from the golf. Well, yeah. there's a thing because, again, I, I remember learning from that. When I, was, when I watched the film again, when I was older, because I was only like one when it first came out. But when I watched it again, I was older and, they talk, and he says, oh, yeah, it came up from the golf and they talk about migratory routes and so on. I actually remember going to find something out about that. And like Anna said, actually going to a library getting a book out and actually trying to learn something. Well, that's like I thought. Right. Came up with the Gulf Stream from Southern Waters. He didn't need a car, did he? No. <laughs> Tiger shark's like a garbage can and leave anything. Someone probably threw that in a river. I wouldn't say that it spurred my advocacy. Intra- Actually, interest. I had, I it definitely spurred my interest in the animal. It was the animal itself for me. Research, research is my thing. I, I just love looking into research. The documentary I made, The Great White Shark Legend, we talked with a lot of people who, who encountered great work. sharks out in the open. Thank you, sir. The encountered sharks out in the open and again realized that it's not Jaws. And it is, you know, every boat you go out on, Dirk, you'll know this. And I'm sure have you, um, you know, Melissa, you hear it in the areas where you are. If anybody's around fishing and sharks are mentioned, someone will pull a Jaws line out and say, we need a bigger boat, you know. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And caught all mm-hmm. the lines. It still has that impact. This is my concern with things like the, the media portrayal of sharks that, Anna, you were talking earlier about, you very easily can sort of distance, you know, 
what the reality from the movie yes, is. Yes, but you didn't let me finish my story. Please, please. <laughs> so I got into sharks because of the movie. And then, you know, years went by, years went by. What kicked me off in advocacy was when I went to the Georgia Aquarium. Now, granted, they don't have any white sharks. Being somebody from Michigan who's probably never going to see a shark in the wild, it was the closest I was ever going to come. And when I stood in the tunnel and a whale shark went over my head, it was it was an incredibly emotional experience for me. Oh, yeah. It was, oh, I got choked up. I'm getting choked up right now just thinking about it. And then I came home and that's when I got on social media. You know, and then started, you know, just learning as much more as I could. And that's, you know, when I found the shark groups and yes, I, I stumbled into O Search and was turned right around by uh, Alessandro. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he, he's, he's the one who brought me into White Shark Interest Group. Now, I, I have a hard time advocating here because I'm surrounded by a lot of people that don't believe in climate change mm-hmm. and shark finning and, and ocean matters are far flung from Michigan. So it's hard for me to get, you know, to get jonesed up about ad because it, it's hard. I, I I have a coworker who I, I keep trying to convince, you know, that, that we need sharks and, and, and sharks are not, they're not killers. They're not man-eating machines. You know, I'm still trying to turn them. In. I have learned so much, but the human psyche is a mysterious, mysterious thing because for as much as I know that we are not on the menu, we are not targeted, they are not monsters. I went to Massachusetts last year with my my daughter and my my stepson and I stood on the beach and it was a, it was a windy day and it was kind of cold so you never would have thought to go swimming anyways the weather just wasn't going to permit it but it was blue skies it was it was pretty but it was really windy so the surf was rough and I just stood there my heart just pounding I mean it literally just just pounding just knowing that they're out there Mm-hmm. And I had to ask myself a question if it was a beautiful calm day and it was warm would I go swimming and I could not answer that question. Even after everything I know, that the fear that that movie instilled in my psyche is still there. Irrational as it may be, it is still there. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. No, absolutely not. It, it was startling to me, though. It, it was a, kind of a little bit of a startling moment because it's like, why? Why is my heart pounding? Why? Why would I be afraid? Is it really fear or is it respect? For the fact that this animal is an apex predator, I think I think it was a, a little bit of both. I mean, I really, I really, I like. I don't, I don't know if it had been a beautiful day. I don't know if I would have went in the water. As educated as I am on the movements of these animals, actually, I had a friend yesterday who's in Massachusetts right now. They had their three children on paddle boards. It, it was right before sunset, so it's kind of like dusk in the background, and the water's flat, and it's beautiful. And they have their three children on these paddle boards, and they're playing in the water in the background, and they're far from the shoreline. And even I reached out to my friend and gave her a little advice because I didn't feel good about seeing her seven-year-old and the other children where they were in the water and the time mm-hmm. of day. There is a reality to these animals. We talked about that with Dave Pearson. There's a good, a bad, and an ugly. There are some areas that we definitely do need to be more aware of what's going on in the waters at the time. I also have footage in Massachusetts from about uh, a week and a half, two weeks ago, where there's multiple bathers treading in the water, and about 15 feet behind them is a group of seals also hanging out in the water. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Always a good mix. This is right in, you know, Massachusetts is supposedly working on their shark mitigation decisions and, you know, behind closed doors or whatever. Nothing's really that public right now on as to how they're going to handle things. I was actually stunned that nobody was telling this group of people to get out of the water. It was just a very ignorant move. And if something had happened, you know, it would have just added to the list of what's going on right now in the northwest right why does media now with all that education that we have why do we not see a show about that on shark week why do we not see a show about that on nat geo why do we not see a show about shark and human interaction risk mitigation why is that not a topic for people to discuss because no one wants to hear it it's not sexy it's not sexy exactly it's not gonna bring in the people it doesn't sell 
I mean, to be real here, how many fundraisers have you seen through the years that had to do with uh, supporting drum lines or supporting, you know what I mean, shark mitigation practices? Right. You don't really see much funding for those areas. It usually comes from the state or the government. Other than the Stop the Bleed campaign um, for the tourniquets, I really haven't seen much for fundraising when it comes to shark mitigation practices. The only place I've seen it is with the shark spotters in South Africa that just that that's a very well a well known Yes. project and, and, and function that it serves now. Uh, just for any listeners, by the way, the uh, Dave Pearson that uh, Melissa mentioned there is on episode nine of our uh, podcast. And I would, again, implore everybody to go and listen to that man's words because he the episode is about surviving a shark attack with Dave Pearson, who runs like support groups for people who have been attacked. And he very much lays out some of the reality of, of an actual interaction with um, with what with the white sharks. Uh, and I, I would implore everybody to go and listen to episode nine. I think it's probably been one of our strongest episodes yeah. What going back to what Melissa just said about the mitigation and all that, it's just coincidence that I just had a like a couple of weeks I got into a discussion. I forgot I put something, somebody posted something about the problems in the the, the poor lady that, you know, unfortunately was a victim in, in Maine. Yes. And then it just kind of sparked a bunch of articles coming out because you know how it is. One comes out, then 20 come out, then you have to delete like 19 of them. But then one sticks and then people start commenting. And I went in, not in a rant, but I went like in a Kind of like that is frustrating to me that they don't do much more. And people say, and sometimes you see a little sign that says, watch out, shark in the water. To me, that's not going to cut it. I'm sorry. You got to be a little more forceful about enforcing people going in the water when you have 20,000 seals swimming around you yes. or in the area. And, and you're letting people go in the water at any time of day without no consequences. And I'm sorry. Then you put the shark in bad in a bad light because they sh- obviously eventually this is going to happen and more people in the water more sh- more seals more sharks in the area or or at least they are showing up because they're more seals and it's just creating a big problem and eventually they will be and then i had i had a discussion with this guy that kept saying no but the shark is not the problem and i kept telling him i understand that but it, it could become a problem not because of the shark because of the people because we as, a, as a humans are not enforcing the rules or putting more like, like and I mentioned South Africa, a yeah. perfect example that they do have spotters and it works perfectly. So why? And the, yeah, I know it costs money and the whole excuse that money. Well, listen, if you want to save lives, yeah. you don't have to put some freaking money into situation and stop crying and whining and, and saying, stay out of the water, go in the pool and the whole bull crap that I'm so tired of hearing every time that there's an in- incident. And, and so it just, you put in the sharks, which, our, our main focus, we don't want anybody getting hurt, obviously. No human wants to get, you don't want them to see that. But I don't want sharks to pay for our, be us, our neglect, our ignorance and being neglectful about situations. And mm-hmm. like you said, put a band-aid on a, on a bigger issue that could become, no, no, I mean it is, it could become a bigger issue in the near future again. Can you imagine a remake of Jaws now with social media as part of the storyline, you know? Because, <laughs> you know, you've got that scene where Brody's, uh, his kid's in the boat, just sat, tied up on the boat, and he's flicking through the shark boat, looking at all the, the pictures of the, um, you know, shark bites and old pictures. Of, mm-hmm. He'd be flipping now, he'd see the White Shark Interest Group, and he'd come in and he'd learn about it, and it wouldn't be a problem. He'd say, okay, stay on the water, it's fine, you know? Yeah. That's a perfect way to bring this up, because, I mean, everything that Javier just said, is, is perfectly valid. And I think that's one of the reasons why groups like the White Shark Interest are so important because we can educate. Mm-hmm. Even though we're hitting 48,000 people right now, that's that's not even a drop in the bucket. Yep. But we, we need to get people to realize that if there are seals in the water, there's something that's probably out there feeding on them. And, and if you're in a surf lineup, if there's a great surf somewhere, chances are there's, there, there are sharks around, around you all the time, which is why I think we we need we need to concentrate on how many sharks could how many shark bites could occur yes, that don't, that don't you know exactly and 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 I think it's it's very important that we educate the the public about it and I know you know some people hear the word education they they start to tune out a little bit but the thing is it's like if you love these animals and you're passionate about these animals especially like Anna was I mean I thought that story was great because I'm glad to know how she came to find mm-hmm. us and. Um, and I think it's important because she's been such a huge asset for us in this whole time. Yes. And the thing is, it's like once you get that passion and that and that bug bites you, you're just in for a world a world of joy after that. Because once you start learning about this stuff, it becomes an addiction. At least it did Maybe for me. Maybe we should stop using the word education and use the word enlighten instead. <laughs> good idea. Maybe, you you know, know? Good idea. 
Back to what Javier had mentioned, part of the reason too is out of sight, out of mind. It's very seasonal here in the Northwest Atlantic. So these officials, they don't want to create fear. We make a lot of money, these shore-based towns, off these tourists. They come from all over every year. And uh, even Massachusetts and Nova Scotia, New Jersey and New York, and, you know, our beaches are covered during this time of year. And sadly... I do think that they try to keep some of this stuff a little hush. You know what I mean? Because they don't want to infringe on those tourist dollars. They need them to survive. Our state needs those tourist dollars to survive. Hey, it's a summer town. It needs summer dollars. Hmm? <laughs> Money talks. You know what I mean? And honestly, I think that is what deters a lot of the work towards bringing more awareness on the beaches and so on and so forth. Another thing I'd like to touch on is if you see dolphins feeding, do not jump out there and try to swim with the dolphins. Dolphins are not there to protect you from sharks. It's a horrible myth. We just had an incident here on the Jersey Shore where a dolphin came into the surf and was taken by multiple sharks, probably about 10 to 15, um, right in the surf here. This is the second time it's happened in the same exact area here in New Jersey. And um, people were blown away. They were like, oh, oh, no, no, dolphins protect us from sharks. And how could this happen? And they were just totally blown away. If you see any animals feeding, exit the water. Avid listeners to the podcast, if you want to know a little bit more about the relationship between sharks and dolphins, then uh, stay subscribed to the White Shark Interest Group podcast because we might have an episode coming up that, that somebody might be able to give us a bit more information on that one. Hey, Drew. Hmm? <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely have to tune into that <laughs> yes. one. That would be a great <laughs> one. As shark advocates, is it okay to still like the movie Jaws, and if so, why? Can I start with yourself, Dirk? You can start with me. And um, I think the movie Jaws is, is compatible with, obviously, shark conservation and protection because it brings out everything as well. I mean, it brings out the misunderstanding that, that we have about these sharks and the inaccuracies that are portrayed. And I think it's like an antithesis, like in Tully's, to looking at it and say, well, this is not what Great White's about. Yes, we see so, you know, similar behavior in Discovery Channel and so forth, but really deep down in terms of also what we portray in our group, the White Shark Interest Group, is that this, you know, although Jaws is an iconic movie and has brought a lot of people the awareness uh, of, you know, of sharks into their living room, literally, I find it compatible in terms of, of you know, being a shark advocate and this case because again it's it's really brought in the sharks into you know into people's living room made people interested in sharks by doing that i do believe that the movie has a, has a, has had a positive effect long term in terms of the conservation and education protection of, of sharks in general thank you anna is it okay to like jaws and be a shark advocate absolutely like i said before you got to take it as what it is <laughs> and it's entertainment it's no more than that there's no reason why we have to compartmentalize everything. I can be an animal advocate without being vegan. Mm -hmm. Why can't I advocate for sharks, but still watch this movie? It's different strokes for different folks. There's no reason why you can't appreciate it for what it is. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Drew? Yeah, I'd say that you can absolutely, uh, just like everybody has said, I think you can absolutely love Jaws. And I mean, you have to you have to take it for what it is, a uh, work of fiction. And I think even the late Peter Benchley would tell you that he had no idea what was going to happen because of Jaws. And he felt immensely guilty for that. As proof of that, he came out with a book called Shark Trouble, which I highly recommend everybody take a read. If you get a chance to get it from your library, get it from online or something like that. He talks about a lot of aspects of sharks that a lot of people don't know. He even put some information in there, how to survive at sea, if you ever find yourself out in sea. It's entertainment. It's something that, that was there for us to enjoy. Hindsight is always twenty twenty. It's tough to say whether I would have preferred it to happen or not happen. I preferred it to happen because I enjoyed Jaws. Uh, the outfall, the falling out after that, of course, there's there's a lot of regrets there. But yeah, I mean, enjoy the movie. Uh, enjoy the other movies, the new movies and stuff like that. Um, it's not a demonization of sharks. It's, it's entertainment. Thank you. Have you yeah, is it okay to like Jaws and be a shark advocate? Heck, yeah. Maybe back in the day, it was an issue. By now, with all the educational uh, information out there, all the social media, all the you could just hit a button and look for information. If by this time, you still think Jaws is a problem to sharks, then I think you have to start looking at yourself in the mirror, and maybe you're the one that has to you know, look for why do you think that you still think that could be a problem. 
And of course, you could still be an advocate to anything just because, like Anna said, uh, you, just because you are, you don't have to be a vegan. You have to be put things in perspective as they are and be responsible for your own, what you think, what you look for. Then don't blame, don't look for copping out with looking for blame and other things, other people, other groups, or other things. Be for, responsible for your own thoughts. At the end of the day, it comes to, like everybody said, entertainment. And if you cannot see that to this day, you're the problem. Melissa. Like Anna said, absolutely. When I give it great thought, a majority of the conversations I have about advocacy, they start off with the other party questioning acts in, in the movie Jaws. So, you know, I often say there's no such thing as a bad question. I do think that Jaws is a stepping stone for a lot of advocates. And uh, I think it has opened the door to um, people wanting to educate themselves further. And I think the damage was already in motion and done way before Jaws came out. I mean, Jaws was basically created off of the damage going on and that had previously already happened in the past. So I've always kind of seen Jaws as a stepping stone to educate others. Um, I've never really seen it as this horrible movie. And I always viewed Jaws the same way I viewed Godzilla, you know, and I loved Godzilla and I love Jaws. <laughs> Okay. You're here. And if I could just offer my thoughts as a father of young children and a film about, I think Jaws is an exceptional, one of the greatest movies ever made. And it was what it was at the time. I know if I sit with my children and I can't wait for my kids to watch Jaws. However, I know that my oldest son, particular Shay, who is a, a huge animal lover and a nature boy, he will cry his eyes out when the shark gets blown up at the end. I know this like for I a did. fact. Oh, yeah. And I think that's something that will endure on with, with future generations. My biggest concern is not Jaws. It's not education. Go out and have the edu go Like Javier said, go and educate yourself once you've had that as the spark. Mm -hmm. I am more concerned about the media that portrays itself as education, but is still selling the horror story that Jaws was. It was a horror film. Don't look at media that portrays itself as education. Go and watch a movie uh, or a lot of the modern movies now that are clearly just horror films about sharks. Go watch them and then go learn about sharks. Don't use TV shows that portray themselves as education and still sell exactly the same message about sharks that they are horror. Mm -hmm. okay. Son of a bitch! Well, we're pretty much out of time. Uh, I know Jaws is one of our favourite topics, and I'm sure for all you listeners out there on the White Shark Interest Group, it is one of your favourite topics as well. We know it is because people still talk about it to this day. So I, I really hope you enjoyed this episode, and huge thanks to Dirk. Bye, guys. Thanks for listening. And thanks to Javier. See ya. And uh, thanks to Melissa. Have a great weekend, all. And thanks to Drew. Thanks for showing up, guys. We'll see you on Facebook. And thanks to Anna. Hi, guys. Uh, that's the most admins we've ever had on a podcast together. If you are not a member of the group, the White Shark Interest Group is Facebook's largest White Shark-specific group, over 48,000 members. If you're listening to this podcast, I would encourage you to go over to Facebook, search the White Shark Interest Group, hit the join button, answer the question about why you want to join, give us a shout out that it was from the podcast and come and get involved in the debates and discussion. You can also find us on Instagram at White Shark underscore interest group, where you'll see not only images, but some education that goes with those as well. And again, I'll reach out to any photographers out there if you want to showcase your work as part of the white shark interest group instagram page go over to white shark underscore interest group and check us out and you can also find us on youtube that may be where you're listening to this podcast right now as well as audio we do have youtube and there's a couple of other videos and we we do aim to put more videos there and we have a website the white shark interest group.com where you can find quick links to this podcast as well as some uh, documents and other information. So with that said, thanks again to all the admins today for joining us on this. Let us know what you think about Jaws and its impact and whether it's okay to like in the comments below. And until then, we will see you guys on the next episode. Farewell and adieu to you fair Spanish ladies. Farewell and adieu to you ladies of Spain. For we've received orders for the sail back to Boston. 
And so never more shall we see you again. Mm -hmm.